GDLS Canada, an industry leader dedicated to supporting our customers and the community. Today we've got something different for you. It's a story that is based on multiple interviews from across the country. And we're going to talk about the first attempt at international box lacrosse, which was 1980, the Nations Cup that was held in British Columbia. And it featured uh, Canada East, Canada West, uh, North American Native Team, uh, USA, and Australia in what would become, uh, you know, the, really the seed for the World Indoor Lacrosse Championships that would come some 23 years later. Underway in the first period. The ball quickly going out of bounds in the blue with the yellow trim, the favored Canada West team, Coquitlam. The black with the yellow trim, the North American Native Warriors. This is Jeff Gill for the Warriors closing in and a good stop by John Lewis in goal for Canada West. I'm not quite sure how the team came together, but I do remember that it brought uh, uh, former competitors together from different nations and it was unifying in that regard. Players from Six Nations in Cataraugus, Aquazus, and the Onondaga uh, playing together for one of the first times that I can remember and later that would be uh, the formula for the Iroquois national team as well where it brought the different Iroquois nations together to play together as opposed to playing against each other. Uh, we used to play in a league called the North American Lacrosse Association, uh, which was primarily a team of, uh, a, a league of native teams uh, with us up here in the Onondagas and the Senecas out west, uh, uh, Newtown and at, uh, there was a team from Buffalo. Tuscarora, Tuscarora, Tuscarora yep. Onondaga. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to travel throughout the territory of the Haudenosaunee mm -hmm. and play against uh, other teams, mm -hmm. but also an event like this brought us together to play with each other, which was mm -hmm. pretty significant. Yeah, I remember um, uh, Pender, what was his name? Roy, Roy Pender was, was the coach back then. Uh, they had Ross Paulus as an assistant. He was on the bench or you know, uh, definitely involved in the team. Uh, those were the two main, main coaches that we had that I recall at that time. Wes Panderson was always in the background in lacrosse because he was also a stick maker from Tuscarora. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was in the background coordinating with the Can-Am because he was also affiliated with, you had a Can-Am East and Can-Am West. Uh, we at Seneca were part of the Can-Am West along with Tuscarora from where Wes Patterson was. Mm -hmm. So he was that affiliate contact on that side of the Can-Am that brought us all together. So, you know, putting those people together and then hooking up with Roy, I think, Pinder? Yeah. And, um, from up at the Squamish Nation, he came on to, to assist with the coaching out there with the Squamish Nation, the North Shore Indian squad. And that, I guess, coordination brought us all together. It made us a lot stronger from it. I think uh, Peter Garo or our coaches I might have put our names up to say, hey, you know, this is coming up. You know, I want you guys to go and play and try out for that team. That's how I recall. I don't remember a particular tryout for the team. Yeah. Just remembering that it was quite an honor because this was the who's who of Native players in, in that era. Well, I, I, I guess my recollection is that um, uh, who, whoever was the, in first place, uh, at the midway point uh, in the major league in Ontario would represent uh, Canada East. And we played Peterborough in the Memorial Center. Um, I think it just happened it was the last game. Whoever won that game um, was going to be uh, the winner. So we, we ended up one of the few times in my career that we actually beat Peterborough in Peterborough and moved on and flew out to Vancouver. We were told at the beginning of the year that uh, whatever team was in first place as of a certain date uh, would be the team that would represent Canada East. So I think there was certainly lots of uh, excitement and anticipation of the possibility of going. And frankly, I don't remember the last game was in Peterborough, but, I, but yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. Um, and we were fortunate enough to win that game and, and therefore get to go out west and represent uh, Canada East. Wayne, were you in goal uh, for that game against Peterborough? 
I was, and I was excited about just beating Peterborough because that was unheard of back then because they had a very strong uh, a junior program prior to that, and they had those people come up over age, and they uh, they uh, did a number on us for a number of years. So it was a payback, and we won the, the proper game to 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 go and play in the uh, 1980 uh, World Championships in Vancouver. Most of us at that point, you know, really didn't travel much. At least I know I didn't. <laughs> trip to Vancouver is a big thing just in itself, let alone being going there to play in a, in a, in a world, world event. And on top of that, beating uh, Peterborough and Peterborough. It was kind of a, it was good on all levels. You know, for, for me, it was kind of a downer. Um, it was about halfway through the second period, I blew my knee out. And uh, for the first time, um, and yeah, I think you have to remember back then, you know, we had a whole bunch of great volunteers, but we didn't have, we didn't really have any real trainers or anybody to look at you. Uh, you know, in retrospect, probably shouldn't have went out again, but we wanted to win. And so I went back out again and then really, really did a good job on the knee. So, um, you know, f for me, you know, that was, that was the only negative of it. And I didn't get to play uh, didn't get to play in Vancouver, unfortunately. I tried to get you to carry my equipment bag, but it was too big for you to carry. <laughs> I kind of can't really remember, but between winning the right to go in Peterborough and going, I don't know, what was it, like a, a week? Maybe a week, yeah, a week or week. something? I don't know, it wasn't very long. We got there, we didn't, uh, we went basically straight to the arena to, <laughs> yeah. to play. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was after, was it after 10 to 12, 12 games? games? 12 games into the season, whoever was in first place Halfway would... would, would but I don't believe we were focused on, on being first. We, we just, every game we played, we, we were pretty good in, that, in, that, in the WLA. We, we uh, were the team up and right up to the end of the season. The trials were going to be through the spring and early summer. So, you know, effectively I moved to Boston um, and, um, uh, you know, had the opportunity to try out uh, for the Team USA uh, over a series of, I think, five or four or five, maybe six, uh, weekend training camps that were held in different uh, East Coast locations, uh, Cornell, West Point, uh, Philly, um, you know, between probably May through June. And, uh, you know, coming out of that is how, how they selected the team. We had some all-stars, Kevin, you know, we had, uh, um, Danny was, was up and coming. And then we had, you know, Kevin Parsons uh, was an all-star coming up at the end of his career, you know, and when you looked at it and, you know, and Jimmy Aitchison also, you know, yeah. was another guy that was, they were kind of the, the guys that were a little older than, than us. And then we had a whole group of us that came in in 76, Randy Bryan, Mojo Dan, myself, and, and the, for just the pro league had just folded. And, 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 then, and then Mike Reilly came. And Mike Reilly came in, the, in uh, after Danny. Rob Delzell. Yeah. Our team really consisted of field players, uh, guys who had had very successful uh, field across uh, careers at Div 1 level, et cetera. You know, most of these guys were former All-Americans. Many of them had been out of, the, out of the, the, the collegiate ranks for, you know, four or five years. I, I think our average, you know, our average age was probably between 25 and early 30s. Uh, I was, along with another guy, the youngest, youngest players on the team. We were 19, still actually in, in university. But we essentially had a, a very cohesive group of, you know, successful athletes, um, many of whom had kind of known each other or perhaps had played together in subsequent uh, decade. And um, none of them were really box across players. Like I say, they were all field, but they were, you know, they were, you know, they learned quickly, they adapted because they were such good athletes and were keen. And I'd say we had right from the get go a, a very cohesive group of guys um, to pull together a team. You know, and Jim, you know, Jim Logan did a, a great job coaching along with Mark Wood, who was a assistant at West Point at the time. But we had some, you know, natural leaders, established guys from the U.S. field community, Dom Starja, uh, Brooksy Sweet, B.J. O'Hara, um, Mike Laterra, Norm Smith, some, you know, some guys who were, were like I said, all-American, top, top field players and knew how to lead uh, and, and knew how to learn and, uh, so for us, it was really an opportunity to, to participate 
uh, on Team USA. I don't think we had sort of stars in our eyes that we were going to necessarily go out and knock off, you know, knock off and, and win the thing. But I think we, we, we wanted to be competitive. We wanted to have a couple wins and, and uh, you know, we, anything could happen. So we approached the whole uh, preparation process as, as, as you know, as, as in as committed fashion as we could. I think we had one or two, um, maybe they were almost control scrimmages prior to leaving for BC. I think we played Oshawa, um, who came down for a, a weekend. But, um, you know, we, we, we headed out to Western Canada with, with a good, solid, healthy group, keen to, to see what we could do against the, you know, the top players in the world. I think it was a nice break. Yeah, and, and it only took us a week. Yeah. Just took us a week out of the out of the schedule. Yeah, and and we're playing with against players. You know, when you're playing the WLA, you're you're you play every team, and you know every player. And over the years, you get to to know their habits and everything else. And also, you're playing against uh, a team out of USA that are a bunch of field or or NCAA football players playing field across, and we don't know their tendencies. So defensively, you had to adjust to to what they do, especially the. Um, uh, the field across players from Australia and, and U.S. They shoot from everywhere, and and you know we weren't used to that style that style of lacrosse. So I think defensively we had to adjust to, on the goal, but offensively they had to adjust to us because we were so used to the indoor game and being able to handle the ball in tight, where some of the teams, you know, uh, didn't understand that, and that's why I think Australia when they invited us down, that's what they wanted to see was. Under pressure, how do you carry the ball in the middle and catch it you know, amongst two players and get the shot off? You know, we spent a lot of time together, competed at that uh, world level of lacrosse and made tremendous amount of friendships. Not only with, you know, who we're standing here today, the three of us, but all those that represented us part of that team. Because there were others that traveled with us that didn't get to play that final game. You know, they're not in the pictures and their names aren't mentioned anywhere. But it's important that they came out with us when the Squamish Nation put up their representatives and the final was picked. So, you know, there were a group of people that didn't play anymore. Oh, okay. And I, you know, and for those that are listening or watching, you know, those people can't be forgotten also. So they traveled with us and, you know, we're just putting names and faces together, but there's faces that aren't in that final picture that had to be recognized because they tried out, like us, got invited and participated, but didn't make that final cut. It was interesting too because, you know, we, we, we have played against each other, we know each other, we, we played in the, uh, in the Native League on the east end of Canada, uh, and to go out there, now we have to gel with, the, uh, with our, our brothers from the Squamish Nation, and that was interesting too because like I said, we play together here, we know each other, but now we're meeting a whole different group that we have to play against and play with. You know, we had, uh, we had scrimmages back then when we went out, there, out to BC. Uh, we had scrimmages we, uh, and playing against each other, trying to uh, kind of mold this team. And then you're playing with, with new people that you haven't played with before. So that was interesting. You got to meet new players, meet the Squamish boys uh, and play with them. The numbers were bigger from the East because we had a, um, all native league. With then, more communities, with more right, communities within to pick our from, own local community. Whereas Squamish was just their, that lone community. Australia just started playing box lacrosse, uh, mostly in Melbourne and, uh, and Adelaide. And Western Australia, which, of which capital, the capital is Perth, they volunteered to host the 1980 national championship. Now, in addition to being a national championship, that was also the, the event in which Australia, the Australian Lacrosse Federation, were going to select their national team, their national box team, to come up here to, uh, to the Lower Mainland in Victoria and Vancouver Island and play in the Nations in 80. And uh, just by absolute fluke, one of the people from Perth, because unfortunately Perth did not have any box lacrosse, so they volunteered to, to, volunteered to uh, host this event without actually having a team. But they did have a decent field lacrosse base. So one of their people was up here, a um, chap by the name of Greg Kennedy, came up to Vancouver to purchase equipment and he was at uh, the, the sporting goods store and mentioned that they'd love to have somebody come down and coach that they'd you know they'd pay for the the accommodation or whatnot and um, I wasn't working at the time I think I was working seasonally so I was off in the winter 
And uh, this message got through to me. I said, yeah, sure, why not? I'll, I'll go down. So I flew into Australia and uh, out to Perth um, and coached actually two teams because we were the host team. We had to put in the, uh, the uh, number one Western Australian team. And then we had a group called the President's Eleven, which I think is a cricket term, I think. But anyway, that's what they called their, their uh, I guess, B team that had to fill out the field so that we had four teams. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was very industrious the way these guys, there was no arena. So what they did is they had a warehouse and the players themselves, and I guess friends and craftsmen and tradesmen or whatever came in, they put in boards, uh, they, brought, they put in bleachers, much like you'd see here at a, a soccer field or a, you know, a baseball diamond, the porch portable uh, bleachers brought them in, lined the, fee, lined the floor, um, the, well, the arena or the, the, the warehouse had washroom facilities upstairs in their offices and they had uh, they had a shower so that was the dressing room so you get you know two games a night and four teams sharing one shower which was which was interesting but that's where we practiced and I, I still remember the first practice I went to because these guys had never never played box lacrosse so I said okay look at our first practice I'll sit up in the stands and watch and see how everybody looks and I'll, I'll never forget they were they were bouncing the ball off the ceiling to each other to, to, for inst instead of a long, you know, a long looping pass, they off the ceiling, and a guy'd catch it. And I remember saying, "Okay, that's it. That's it. Enough observing. Let's let's get get down to business." But it went really well. And then at the end of the thing, we actually ended up um, the Adelaide team, the uh, South Australia team, which actually Rod Bannister, who uh, of course most people know, played for the Samboys, had a great career with Burnaby Juniors and the Samboys. He was down there on vacation. He ended up helping out with them, and they play. We played them in the final. Um, they beat us, uh, I don't know, quite handily. But the other point, and probably the main point of this, was to choose the, uh, the Australian team that was going to come up here. And I was a part of that process, as was Rod. And we, you know, we looked over all the other rosters and whatnot, and they came up with, uh, with the team that would eventually come up here and, uh, and play in, uh, in BC. I think for a lot of us, for the Nations in 80, there's uh, half the team had played in Middle Cups and, and Man Cups, or you know, been picked up, Danny got to play in some Middle Cups. Greg played in a lot of Middle Cups in Peterborough and that. For some of us that had never had that opportunity, it was, it was a, a different exposure for us to play at something that a lot of people are looking at. And you walk into an arena that's full, you know, when in the WLA back in the 70s, the arenas were full. But to walk in the, the Pacific Coliseum, you got 8,000 fans and a lot of, I remember a lot of drums playing for the, for the uh, other team, the native team and that. And, that was, uh, I think, for some of us, was, uh, eye eye-opening that to play in front of that, the world uh, scene uh, stage. So that's what I remember. It was just that uh, was phenomenal the way the uh, the Canadian lacrosse, BC lacrosse, had uh, went professional on this for for the whole tournament. You know, there was press conferences, there was all sorts of stuff going on, and it was, I think, for a big deal for uh, for the game of lacrosse and uh, for the, a lot of those players. In the dressing room before the first game against uh, Canada East, where you know we felt we were certainly underdogs, um, but were you know we we had you know we were pumped up. Our coach got us you know just roaring in the dressing room, and uh, you know talking about you know just think of the you know ABC Wild Water Sports and and just everyone's got eyes on you and you're representing Team US. And we were chomping to get out of the dressing room. And I just remember sitting back going, oh my God, here I am, I'm 19 years old. I'm playing with all these stellar athletes who were you know, legends in the American field game. We're about to go out on the floor and take on you know, the top Ontario senior men's team. And I was like, this is, this is gonna be a great experience. And, um, so I do remember that moment in the dressing room when we were just about to go on the floor. We came out of there, and I think we came out of there like caged animals. And Team Canada, you know, or Canada East, just I, you know, they they probably didn't know what the hell, who the hell these guys were, because we were we were charged up. I think most of our players would have known the West would be very strong. You know, there there'd been enough players that, you know, we knew the West was going to be good. Um, you know, I think the unknowns is what, you know, what were the Iroquois going to be like? What were the Aussies going to be like? You know, how how was the U.S. going to be, even if they had all their best players playing box? You know, so, um, you know, for me that was kind of interesting. 
you know, I spent two years or, or four years down there playing field against them. Um, so I was kind of curious to see how they would do playing box. Our first game um, of the tournament on day one, uh, it was against Team uh, Canada East, and which was essentially the Brooklyn Redmen, I think, uh, who were the top team at that stage in, uh, in Ontario. Uh, and, you know, we came out, we were fired up, um, ready to play. Uh, and we, you know, we took it to them a little bit. I think, I, I think you know, we kind of caught them off guard a bit, maybe. I'm not sure. We also had uh, our, our goalie at the time, John Yeager, played, you know, exceptionally well. I think a lot of us hadn't played field. Um, so we were used to uh, box. And I think we were, my recollection is we were a little surprised at how adept they were both, uh, with, both, with both stick hands. And so I think on defense that caused a little bit of problems because you had to play a little bit differently. And I think we got a little better as the game went on. Um, but yeah, I remember it being a little bit of a rude awakening as you'd shade to one side and all of a sudden that was probably not the right way to play. We went back and forth the whole game and um, that first game, you know, we were a hair away from upsetting them, which would have been considered an upset. Um, we had them down 10 to 9, and with about less than 10 seconds left, um, you know, we turned the ball over in our own end. One of their guys slipped down to the crease, and I, I mean, I can still see it today, you know. The guy was wide open down to the crease, fed it across down to him, and, and John Yeager came across, but he just, just couldn't quite get there quick enough, and they popped it in. Tied it up with, let's say, five seconds left, went into overtime. You know, we had the, that just kind of deflated our, you know, deflated our, uh, uh, everyone on the team. Just you could almost see the sol shoulder slump a little bit. And they came on and, and handed it. To, I think it would, we had, eventually, they, they beat us by four or five in overtime. So that was a disappointment, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, it said, you know, hey, we, we can compete. I mean, we obviously were, you know, we, we played with a lot of passion um, and we got a few breaks here and there and our goaltender played unbelievably well. But, uh, you know, that was a disappointment, but at the same time, uh, you know, a, a reason positive first step. So I think the U.S., that, that game, if, I, if my memory serves me right, I think the game actually went into overtime. Really? I think we were tied 10-all after, after regulation, which I think was a bit of a surprise, uh, probably for us more than them. Um, but I think, and then in overtime, you know, we hadn't been out there very long, so I think you know, the game came together. I think we ended up outscoring them in overtime by five, and I think we won 15 to 10, I think is my recollection. So it, it was probably more relief at the end of the game than anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, yeah, I, my recollection was a little panic near the end where we were, we were still tied. I think one of the things that you were talking about why the Australians were late four hours because they didn't know the layout of Vancouver. Yeah. But you can look at it on the other side is that one of the games that was supposed to make national television on a Canadian television was the match between Canada East and Canada West. That was two hours delayed, you know? So they didn't even air it. Oh. Well, so that could have made a if difference. You look, yeah. Well, if you're, these are world games. Yeah. If you're sitting back airing and you want to watch this <laughs> Canada's national sport, summer sport, which is boxed across, and all of a sudden you keep saying delay, 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 that's going to... Why was it delayed? Oh. It was a plane that they use to fly over broke down. We had just taken off. Um, we used to fly over to Victoria on a, on a company called Yellowbird Air. It was a DC-3, um, really dependable airplane. We had just taken off um, and we're still climbing in, to Victoria, the probably only climbing to 3,000 feet. So we were, like I say, 45 seconds to a minute after takeoff. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the starboard engine just went, there was smoke and, and all this sputtering. And, and somebody on the right-hand side of the plane said, we just lost an engine. And to my memory, um, somebody on the left, I think it was uh, Cochran, said, no, well, that's nothing. This one's got oil smeared all over it. Yeah. And we had, a, we had this debate the other day talking, did we lose one engine or did we lose two? But to my mind, we lost both because the pilot did a 180. And I thought that was unusual because I used to fly a 
small private plane. I had a private license at the time. And uh, we did, he did a 180, like right then. And he needed enough altitude to get back to the runway. And uh, I thought if we had lost one engine, he probably would have done a circuit and come back in. But uh, so I think we lost both, both engines. And it was, it was quite frightening because, uh, you know, the, the, we had an old, an old girl that was a stewardess and she was kind of frantic and, and uh, not, nobody knew what was happening. We just knew we were going down. We were in trouble. And uh, <clears throat> she started saying, you know, all the things that you say, you know, put your heads down, grab a pillow, you know, put your heads down on your knees. And, and it wasn't long between when that all happened and we actually came in. And guys were, I mean, you looked around the cockpit and, and there, was, there was some real fear there. You know, there's big, tough guys that were going, you know, what's going on? And uh, I think the funniest thing to my mind when that all happened is um, it was dead silent before a touchdown. And um, Rico Bluski was on that team. And we just said, uh, no peeking. And just before we touched down, and this brought out this huge laugh and... And we hit the runway, and everything was fine. But it was, yeah, it was quite the, quite the experience. Yeah, but the fire engines were there and everything. It was a, it was a big deal. Yeah, it was huge. And, yeah. and we didn't want to go back on another plane. Yeah, there was a few guys that weren't going to get back on an airplane. Dave Cochran wasn't going to get back oh, on. We had a few players that were afraid of flying anytime. Yeah. Right? And uh, then all of a sudden, you expect to get back on another plane and go play a game of cross. Took some convincing, I guess. Yeah. And yet you did get back on a plane, and you went, and about two and a half hours later, you were on the floor in yeah. the plane. Well, yeah. that, that was kind of the hard part, because it was a pretty traumatic little episode. And when we, sure. got, we got to <clears throat> Victoria and the Memorial Arena, the crowd was booing us, and, you know, <laughs> like you guys are you're doing this on purpose. You're showing up, you know, to stall this game and everything else. It was kind of that thing, but, uh, yeah, it is what it was. We lost that game. I think, yeah, we lost that game by two or three goals, I think. And I think we were up after two periods. So it was a very good game. My recollection was exciting, both, you know, back and forth for most of the game. But at the end, they scored a couple of goals. And then I think beating us by two or three goals. It was a close game. And we won nine to seven. I'll never forget that. Because yeah. after, we, we figured that's, that was our third game. Yeah, third game. Yeah, because we sure. played the U.S. next. So the third game, and uh, that was going to get us over the hump. We'll get into the final, and we'll, and we'll all be good. But um, but it was it was a tough game, and 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 I remember because we all had to stay at the university that night because you couldn't fly back. No planes to fly us oh, back. Right. So we had to stay at the university that night, and we had a few drinks. I, <laughs> I did <laughs> many. Yeah. Just give you a bit of background. The three of us come from three different organizations when we got to senior. Okay, and the senior loop to Brooklyn. Stan was with the Green Gales. I played my first year junior with Stan and the Green Gales, but John came from Scarborough. So the three of us basically came together for that year as, I think we were the year, the year before that too, but we're just gelling together. And my background is I played in the two middle cups out west. So I already had the experience of being out there whereas they, they didn't get the opportunity that I, I was lucky to have. Uh, playing the USA, I do remember playing it, but I don't remember which game it was. Uh, it was exciting that uh, we were playing USA, but obviously we wanted to play the, uh, the Six Nations team and the, uh, and the Canada West team. And the Australians at the time were very strong in box lacrosse too. I thought, I thought we were going to win. It was out here, and we had a dynamite team. So... Whatever the East could send out, I, I didn't think they'd challenge us, and they never did. Except for the one game was 9-7, but, but um, other than that, we just blew through the tournament. On day two, uh, we played um, against um, uh, the First Nations team, the Warriors, who were made up of guys um, from uh, central, you know, upstate uh, U.S. and central Canada uh, combined with uh, First Nations players from the B.C. League. Uh, and I, they actually, um, uh, they, they came together at tournament time. I don't think they actually even saw each other before tournament time. So that they had a little preparation. But I think 
people knew they were going to come along. They had very talented players. Um, and while uh, BC or Team Canada West, I would say, would have been considered the favored team um, it, in the tournament and on their home turf, uh, certainly um, the Warriors and Canada East were neck and neck, I think, um, as number, you know, as, as a team, teams that would be expected to be in the final. To me, I noticed that they were field players. We, we played box. I, I'm comfortable in a box, you know, playing the box game. And uh, I could tell that they, they weren't comfortable in, you know, playing in a confined area. And um, I thought they were out of their element when, when we played them. Um, and then just to reverse that, you know, playing box, then converting to field, that's the way I must have felt the way they felt because uh, when, when we play field, I'm not really comfortable. It's a lot of X and O's. And uh, to me, I, it's, I, I have to think a little more when I play that game. I'm more comfortable playing box. So I can see where they were coming from back in 1980 playing box. A uh, few players playing box, now me being a box player going to field. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more of a transition for me to do that. They were quick, skilled, um, not a big team, but you know, would friggin' make you pay if you ever got into a man down situation with them. I think they probably scored on maybe not every, but you know, a lot of man ups they had uh, against us. Um, I also remember one of their standouts, um, uh, Barry Palace, and there were a number of Palaces on that team. I think either brothers or cousins, I'm not sure. But Barry had played uh, a few years before that um, for Six Nations in the Ontario Junior B League while I was playing for Ottawa. So I remember seeing Barry, you know, as, as the first time I, I played in Ontario, and he was such a great player, obviously, in junior, just a standout. And uh, um, uh, I, so he, he was on that, that uh, um, Warriors squad and, and, and led them. I, he might have been one of their top goal scorers during the whole event, but certainly... You know, he uh, he lit a, lit us up pretty good. I think the final result was probably fifteen seven or or eight. I mean, we we kind of hung with them, but they they uh, you know they 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 were a more talented team and, and deserved to win that day for sure. You know, weren't you guys the Iroquois Nationals? The answer is no, we weren't. We were the North American natives that were thrown together in weeks, but we never got to practice together as a team. I thought, you know, if you gave us two weeks, three weeks, I, I believe we would have won that. Mm -hmm. I really do. Yeah. We just didn't, we know one another competing against one another, but not positioning ourselves to play together. Mm -hmm. And I think we had one practice we played we yeah. mm -hmm. before we played our first game out there mm -hmm. at, at that world level. And I think the same could be said for the Australians. They didn't have very much box lacrosse experience and the goaltending is very different. You know, the, the nets are different, the, the movement's different, the, the, whole, the whole stance is different. And you go from field across holding the stick with two hands versus the one-handed box goalie and uh, different angles, uh, it's, uh, it's quite different. I remember, I don't know if we ended up playing the Iroquois team twice or just once, but I know, I know the, the one game that is pretty vivid was a, um, it, it was just a really close, it was like a one goal game. Yep. And I think it was, and it was, the place was packed, and it was very electric. It was just a really loud crowd, and we squeaked it out at the end. And um, from our point of view, the officiating was so bad yes. that we, like most of our team, went down and were yelling at the refs. And this is after we won, <laughs> which typically. Oh, well, rest were bad, we won, but um, that, I, I just remember that. I don't know if you guys remember I think it that. ended up being a one-goal game, I think you're right at the end, and it was a very, very high-scoring game, I believe. It was like 19 to 18 or 20 to 19 or something like that, so I just thought an amazing amount of goals um, for a game at that time. But uh, again, it was really exciting. It was nice to come out on the right side. And, and Stan, you're, I think we did end up playing them twice. I think we got beat the second time by them by a goal or two. We finally did get our first W. Uh, our first win was on, uh, I think, day three, or maybe we had a day off between those games. But, but our third game was against Australia. And, um, you know, the Aussies, they traveled a long way. They were, they were keeners. I think at that time with, uh, you know, heightened awareness of the international field game, you know, Australia and the, 
the big upset that Canada had in the 78 field games over the U.S., um, that there was a, a, a burgeoning interest in international playing. Australia made the effort to get there. Um, I think the previous year, perhaps, or 78, there was also uh, lacrosse as an exhibition or demonstration sport at the um, Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. So, you know, the Australians made a commitment to, to put together a team to come up and play. Uh, you know, they were feisty, keen. They, they, uh, they didn't have probably the, you know, the same, you know, skill level, I'd say. Um, uh, and, a, and a smaller pool of players probably to pull from because I, I believe, but at that time, you know, the Australian field program, um, you know, they didn't have much of a box program. They had a field program, but it certainly wasn't as strong as the U.S. field program. So we, we had a, a, you know, a much deeper pool to pull from. But yeah, no, it was, a, it was a feisty game against the Aussies. I think we may have taken them a little lightly. We actually ended up going into overtime, which we were, you know, we kind of, you know, dodged a bullet there. But uh, we, I think we maybe, you know, had the day off the day before and, and uh, weren't 100% prepared as we should have been. But uh, so that was, that was good. That was a physical game. And we did come out top, so it was nice to get our first W. In Team USA's last game, we uh, went up against the uh, the Adnacks, who were representing uh, Canada West at the time, home team. Uh, I believe we actually played them over in Victoria. Um, and um, one thing that I remember, again, as a young as a young player playing with you know giants in a sense. Um, and in the heart, or the, you know, the kind of the heartland or the hotbed of, of lacrosse in Canada, I remember going to see a senior A game the day before our game against Coquitlam. And Coquitlam was representing this league. Coquitlam uh, was in first place at the time in the uh, BC Senior A League. But we went to see, um, I think it was, it was certainly Victoria, the Shamrocks, and I want to say New West, um, the Burrards. No, it was Vancouver Burrards. Uh, play the senior game and at the time Kevin Alexander played for Victoria and I just remember watching this guy um, knowing that he would have been playing against the you know he'd be part of the, the the same crowd that we were playing against the next day and he was unbelievable uh, seeing him out there especially on the man up I mean every single man up they had and it was a physical game I, you know, he, you know, all they were trying to do was get the ball to him with a shooting opportunity. And I, I've never seen anyone with a shot like Kevin Alexander's and he'd score 75% of the time. He, he was just something else. The other weird thing I found is that whenever they turned the ball over, when they were on the man up, Kevin would just walk off the floor. He wouldn't run off the floor. He'd just walk off the floor. They'd put someone on to, you know, chase the ball down, get a, get possession back. And then Kevin would walk out to the top of the top of the friggin' Uh, power play and, and inevitably he'd score. I mean, he must have had five or six goals, but uh, that was a little sidebar. Um, so in our game against uh, the Adnacks, again, they were, you know, they were, they were certainly a stronger team um, and uh, just more finish, more polished around the net. I think they had us for 17 or 18 goals that game. We might've had seven or eight, but um, uh, again, a, you know, reasonable showing. We were, we were competitive. I don't think we were ever in a point where we, we had the game in our hands, certainly, but we, we were competitive and, uh, uh, you know, overall uh, uh, had, a, had a, a decent game. I think we had probably eight or 9,000 people in the stands, which, is, which was a big number at that time for across anywhere. So, yeah, it was certainly memorable. Well, I think for me, I mean, I had experience in both of those things. I had just finished um, a year or two years down at North Carolina State playing field lacrosse. So, I knew what the Americans were bringing to the table. I mean, they're going to be really good athletes. They did things that we weren't capable of doing because they grew up being this ambidextrous thing, going left and right. But they played in big open spaces, and it's, it was quite a different game. And Frank touched on it. I mean, you're playing in a tight quarters where guys are smacking you, hitting you. You, didn't, you don't see that in the field game. You've got all kinds of space, and they're not touching you unless you've got the ball. And uh, it's, it's a totally different environment. Um, so in that respect, yeah, it's just um, I didn't think they would challenge us because even being good athletes, I, I think it was such a different game um, that that they weren't going to be. A, I mean, I, I knew they would be good athletes and they would run like crazy and all those things, but I didn't think they would be a competitive with the better box lacrosse teams at the time. And that's 
change now because um, you know young American kids are starting to play indoor games and just to get those those skills with playing the game in tight. It, we weren't used to shooting the ball and missing the net and being behind that in the field game. The, the, the closest team to where the ball goes out after a shot gets the ball. Well, in box across that doesn't happen. It hits the boards and bounces off and and you know. Typically, an indoor player has better read on where the ball's going to bounce after the shot, where they aren't used to that, you know, especially uh, the U.S. and, and, uh, and Australia. Uh, Canada East were used to it, so for us to play against them, there, you know, there's always been a difference in style between the East and the West, so you know, we just had to adapt to their style a little bit. But where, where we were lucky, we had uh, guys like Greg, who came from Peterborough, Randy Bryan, Mojo Dan. We had a lot of guys that had the exposure to the East that came from the East that were playing for us. So, you know, I think uh, from that point of view, we, we, we had the advantage on mostly every team when they came out here. I think we, lost, we, lost. we ended I think up losing. It was, it was, I think it was really close to about the last 10 minutes, and then there was a couple of quick goals, and, uh, and then the game was over. <laughs> I think the teams were pretty close, you know. Um, I think there were a few injuries, frankly, you know, stand, standing into play at all. That would have made a big difference. Um, but hey, they've got a lot of good players then and they do now, so. Well, you can win one game. They, you know, we had two close games against them. So obviously, yep. we, were, we, were, we were pretty close. Um, and I, I'm not sure how uh, Travis played that second game, but he, he's just a player that I didn't really know anything of, Travis Cook. <clears throat> And it, he just stood out of, you know, what a great athlete, uh, <clears throat> not only a great athlete, but what a great lacrosse player he was. Just big, strong, you know, good, good hands, good shot. Um, you know, he was, from my recollection, he was their, you know, their, their catalyst to, to beat us. It's not fair to say who's got the hardest shot, who hasn't got the hardest shot. I've been asked that question lots of times throughout my, my years. Hey, no. Just, hey, just look over. <laughs> look over. Look over this way, and I'll I'll think you're pretend you're looking at me. I would like to think Greg Williams, but it's probably the weakest shot I've shot. <laughs> anyway, uh, then oh, he had a heavy shot, but it wasn't. There's a lot more people that have harder shots than some of these other uh, some of these players. From that trip there, we had uh, we didn't have a lot of talent but we had steady talent. Uh, a lot of hardworking people, a lot of what we call the grunt people that got the ball to our, our people that normally put the ball in. And the game's totally changed. Now you got that offense, defense, where we never had that. We had five guys go up both ends of the floor and you know, now, now they, they play offense or defense. So we didn't have that luxury of playing you know, our top goal scorers like they do today. So every time we scored, it was, we had to, Yep. To, to stay in the game, so and we didn't have an awful lot of I'll call pure goal scorers on our on our we were, uh, team we at were that time. Very well-rounded team. Yeah, I remember the um, we prior to that championship game we played Canada East, which was Brooklyn. It was a tough game. I remember that, and you know, winning it. And afterwards, um, you know, us getting together later on, the game is over. You know, we're. We're uh, in our hotel when we were in, I think we stayed at the, uh, at the dorms at one of the, uh, at the university there. So we're all together there and we're talking about the next day. Um, I know I couldn't sleep well that night. I remember that because of the excitement. And then we go to, the, to this game, uh, the championship game. And I was, I was disappointed in that. I know that the uh, Coquitlam team had a, a day of rest, whereas we played back to back. And I always thought that was kind of like a factor too that why didn't we get a day of rest for this big game? You know, we could have played, you know, a lot better. Um, we had just played a, a, a really tense game with, with Canada East, and now we're going against Canada West. And uh, I, I always felt that that played a factor in us, too. Well, I do believe there was an upset because they beat uh, Canada East. Yeah. Right? So the all-star team did beat Canada East. So, so that was an upset. I think everybody kind of thought it was going to be Canada East versus Canada West. Yeah, I they, thought so. Right? So they, they, they came together and... and uh, and be, and I think they upset the the the, uh, the East. Yeah, they did. They were a good team. They were a run and gun style team. Um, they could shoot. They could shoot. Um, Which team is this? The native team. The, the, yeah. um, North American were, Indian. Yeah. yeah. You know, again, I think there was, from what I recollect, they 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 had you know, 
uh, players from east, west, south of the border. They brought together uh, the best players they could to, to, to challenge for this uh, uh, world championship. And they were a good team and they had some field players, they had some box players, they had a great mixture of, uh, of talent on that and they, could, and they could run and they were good athletes. Who is that one guy, Dills? Dills or? Jeff Gill. Yeah. Yeah, really good player. Really good player. Could shoot either and, hand. And Harry yeah. Pallas. Yeah. You know, they, they, had, they had a great goalie, Ernie Mitchell. Pro they, league, pro league goalie. Yeah. yeah. I thought both goalies played well for them. And this is Randy Bryant. Canada West opening with their top line. Underhand, he scores. Number 18, Randy Bryant makes it one nothing Canada West. Uh, we were very competitive, and in fact, we're winning the game uh, in the championship game, but uh, we were unfamiliar with zone defense. And I don't know if it was a new rule, uh, but it was something that we weren't quite accustomed to. And we got called for several penalties in the third period, which turned the game. We were winning at, prior to that, but after they called us for zone defense two or three times, uh, Coquitlam took advantage and ended up turning the game around. Back to Gill. Lobs it out to Frank Davis. Davis tries the right side. Now back to Gill. The other hand shot, he scores. But I think we would have won it had it not been for that rule, honestly. We were a well-balanced team. We had, you know, three solid lines that, uh, that any line could score. And, and where if they, the other teams adjusted defensively to, you know, they'd say, okay, you got Dan Wilson. Well, they put their best players in Dan Wilson. The second line could come out and score just as equal. And I think at the end of the game, when you looked at the, the score sheet, it was pretty well divided between the three lines that, that scored that uh, scored in that championship game, and our you know and our goaltending, um, you know Greg and John Lewis uh, shared goaltending, and we were comfortable with both of them in the net for at, at any given time in the game. We, that didn't change our how we played. Gord Quilty out in front, just blocked there. The shot from Mark Belastin. Quilty again, another fine stop by Mitchell, and this time they beat him. On the Canada West gets a fast break. Here's Wilson, he scores! I don't remember a lot about the particular tournament other than the, the last game, which was indelible in that. I thought we should have won that game, and uh, that, that one rule really put, a, put it the kibosh to us. Uh, I do remember the camar camaraderie of, of meeting players from other nations and playing with them for the first time. I didn't really know there was a, a Squamish nation playing lacrosse out in British Columbia until, until we really got out there and uh, saw that, wow, these guys can play. You know, I always thought lacrosse was a Northeastern kind of game. Uh, I went away and played in prep school and college and saw how field lacrosse was focused in the private schools and the universities there. I didn't realize how widespread it was across the, the indigenous nation. So to go out to BC and, and see the quality of lacrosse out there uh, was eye-opening for me, uh, but it was just a tremendous uh, experience to, to join with players from other, other uh, nations in, in the East and uh, to represent the, what you call us, the North American natives? North American I, I didn't even remember the name. Yeah. I just think of us as a, an, an Indian team, a native team. This is very quick Canada West team pounces on. Right in front, there's the goal scored by Mark Velasquez to make it 11 to 7. Don't ever want to make an excuse at that level. You know, you're there, you're going to play. Uh, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. And I'm just thankful that the three of us and the rest of our teammates were able to participate because that's a living memory. Canada West have it all wrapped up here with a six goal lead. Shot, score! Right. It's a gallant, gallant uh, warrior team, and uh, there they are they're with, with a little more than a minute to go, pulling their goaltender, moving the ball around for a, for a shot, a power, well, not a power, but an odd man goal. That was Frank Davis, number 12, putting it away. So it's 16 to 11 now, with a minute and seven seconds and remaining. Warriors, 11th goal scored by number 12, Frank Davis. The assist to the two, early minutes eight, of this third period, ironically, after uh, the Warriors came within one goal at 8-7 was their undoing when Canada West unloaded the heavy artillery. I believe it was just about five in a row there, Don. That, I think that did it. 
Parsons with less than a minute remaining. Jim Kelly. Kelly being warded off by Jeff Gus, number three, gets it down behind the goal. Here's the relay too far and behind. Parsons out in front. And that break was cut off in a hurry by Kelly as the goaltender Mitchell comes out again. The Warriors refusing to quit here with 30 seconds yeah, remaining. They're, they're trying keep, everything. They're going to keep shooting. They want to make it as close as they can. Bouncing loose in the Canada West goal area. And Canada West with Kelly in possession now. Back to the goaltender, Greg Thomas. Just 15 seconds left. He'll bounce it down to Mattinson. Well, it's been a it's been a it's been a fine show for for a first time we're having a world's box the cross uh, tournament. Five down to three seconds now. They look up at the clock, and up to the crowd it goes. It is all over with the Coquitlam Anadax representing Canada West defeating the Can Am Native Warriors 16 to 11 to win the gold medal here in the World Box the Cross Championship in Vancouver. The final score once again, 16 to 11. Canada West wins the gold medal. To me, the, the really important thing about 80 is um, that it, it, it planted the seed. You know, and the people who put it on from BC were kind of visionaries for international box. You know, so, you know, I don't think, you know, the timing was right for it to be sustainable at the time. Um, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, but it certainly, you know, was, was, you know, the, you know, the footprint for international box that led to the first sanctioned world championships um, in 2003. So it's, you know, very, very important uh, milestone in box across history. I think at the beginning of the year, the goal was to go out west. I don't think the goal was to, you know, it's, if you, I think you'd ask people, would you rather go west and play for the Worlds? Or I think people have said, that's our focus. And I think when you came back, and I think it's fair to say we were a little disappointed. We'd like to have done a bit better. Although the games against you know, the, the winner and the silver place team were both were all close. Well, to me, and it, it sticks more after the fact, years after the fact, that you were part of something very unique. It was the first ever games indoor world championships. And um, I mean, we've seen where the game is, is gone in both outdoor and indoor since. I mean, it was, it was just a unique time that hadn't, something that hadn't never happened before. Um, yeah, it was just, a, you know, to play international lacrosse in, a, in an element where you grew up playing this, this game, the indoor game I'm talking specifically, was, was unique and just fabulous, it, you know. Most of these guys uh, played with plastic sticks, um, most of my teammates. I still had a, I and one other guy I think still played with Woody's, like, you know, I think I had a played with a Martin at the time. And during one of the early practices, we were working on our man up and I was kind of at the point and um, uh, we were just trying to get the ball moving, you know, just, just you know, just quickly. And um, at a break, Brooks, Brooks we was playing on the crease, on the, on the, on the left side, uh, the floor, the crease, and uh, his dad always was around. His dad was a great guy. He always very supportive and helping the team with anything he could, just a real gentleman. And he, he beckoned me over to the friggin' side of the rink and, and over the glass, and he says, he, he said, try this stick. So he, he handed me over the glass, I think Brooks' backup stick or whatever, maybe just had it around, and it was Brian Superlight 2. It had a red head and this shaft on it that was like a feather, like it had nothing to it. So. You know, all these guys who were who were playing with these these field sticks, a lot of the time early on, you know, they ended up snapping them or bending them because they, you know, had to lay a heavy cross check or whatever. So so Brooksy's dad said, Why don't you try this on the floor in a man up situation and see what you think? And I just couldn't believe how much quicker I could get the ball in and out of my stick because of the stick was so light, it was so consistent, and um, you know. You know, uh, at the time, all our guys were using them, and it was just an interesting time for the technology to see as this was coming out of the U.S. Um, and and some of the Canadians that were probably playing field at the time in the U.S. and collegiate ranks were starting to adopt it as well. But you certainly didn't see it in mainstream box at all. If you look back at that 1980 team, even with um, Team USA, you know they put a bunch of people together really, really quickly. 
the story wasn't on the field though, the story was off, you know. They didn't like how, again, conversations off the field on how things were set up. Um, maybe because of the many years, but they were anti-Canadian lacrosse. Some of the players on that team, competition-wise or... Um, well, they didn't like what we did to them in 78. <laughs> no, and they didn't, they, they thought they were competitive. They could put people together to be competitive at that level, but they were so, so um, far away from that thought process to be true. Yeah. And only after the games were completed did they realize, you know, how this, how, how this team from the reservation whip our ass, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that was the thought back then. Is that, you know, how'd you guys... understand the process? <laughs> yeah, but, and, you know, I don't think... Well, there are a few people that were, that played the pros on our team in the 1980. They had previously pro experience. But the rest of us, you know, were a bunch of young guys eager to participate in something that, for the first time. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, Peter, with his thought process was, let's get these guys experience at this level because there's something in the future for it to, you know, mm -hmm. to continue this game and to show it to the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is dead. That's, that's what's really happened. And I think when Onondaga hosted the World yeah. Box Championship, they also got to see the cultural end of it. Yeah. Including the USA. Yeah. Every game or things that participated, when they host it, weren't as culturally enriched as what Onondaga did at that territory. Yeah. And the comments that came about, again, from off the field and the players that, who participated, because I was there, yeah. I got to watch a lot of the games, got to talk to a lot of the people, is that this was done right. Yeah. You know, the cultural experience, yeah. the keepers of the game, yeah. the medicine holders, the ones that utilize it for the best and the best of the community, for the health and welfare. And I think they got a really good understanding for the first time ever that was being held on nation territory and what goes along with it and what that game means to yeah. native players. It means everything. Yeah. It really does. Part of our culture. Proud to know that we're the ones that, and still are, playing the game with woodies, even though the corporations have changed it to plastic fiberglass, all the other things to make rules to better sell their product. But we played when there was only a hickory stick that was available. The old wood feels a heck of a lot better on somebody than plastic and aluminum. But those rules came in and changed the game. They said, well, we don't want as many people hurt. What strengthens the soul, encourages a better understanding of the game that you're playing, but it also creates that atmosphere of what you can handle and what you can't. And I think for me personally, and I can't speak for the other two, is that being hit with a woody stick did a lot for my character. It put me in a path of strength and understanding. So who were some of our, our leaders? Um, you know, I, uh, I think we had, as I mentioned, like a tremendous group of athletes who were top drawer in the programs that they played in for the most part in their certainly in their intercollegiate careers and beyond um, but, but there were some exceptions i would say the guys that i thought were you know our leaders um would certainly be guys like brooks sweet um you know who who just he just picked up the game so quickly um and uh he uh you know, he was great around the net. He, you know, here's a guy who was obviously a all-world athlete, you know, which he, he was designated, I think, a few years after that in the 82 Worlds. But Brooksy was, he was quick. He wasn't big. He had, you know, his IQ, his sport IQ was just so broad that he, he was, he just developed quickly and um, uh, was always, you know, looking and trying to be aware and taking everything in uh, and per performed. He was, I think he probably was our top goal scorer out West, if not one of the top two. 
Um, and Brooksy was, was, you know, here's a guy who had to go, like all of us, or all the, all the field players, you're going from shooting on a six by six net, no, no 30, you know, no shot clock, um, to, you know, Brooks had a nose for the net. He'd find his way in tight and, you know, in the matter of months, all of a sudden he added a couple of, you know, new fakes and, you know, he just, he just was like a vacuum. He just sucked it up and he produced, he was, he was, and he was a great guy to play with. So I remember Brooks as a leader. Um, Dom Starger right from the get-go was a sort of a consummate, like he was older. Dom was probably 30, early 30s and guys, you know, obviously he was, he was a legend in his own, in his own right, but guys looked up to him and he was a strong, quiet, sort of big, strong, but gentlemanly, you know, a, a sort of a, you know, a, a, a man of the game kind of thing, you know. Um, so Dom was a real leader for us. Um, and then I would say other two guys, B.J. O'Hara. B.J. O'Hara was a class act. He was like Brooksy, sort of same style of play, like, you know, quick, um, you know, see the floor well, good, made good decisions, good team guy, um, always knew when to bear down and when to keep it light. Um, so BJ was great. Also, he always, he was a few years older than the average guy on the team. And then the other guy that I, I took, you know, I, I liked and thought but made an impact was Eddie Ballenbacker. And Eddie, like me, he was, he was, we were the two, you know, young pups on the team. We were both 19. Eddie was either, I think he was second year, uh, cadet at West Point midfielder. And the guy was built like a friggin', you know, stud. He was about 6'2", 195, and just ripped like you think, you know, Mr. Marine is. And um, he could run and like a gazelle. And he was big and strong. And uh, one or two games, he just put the lights out on a few guys just through his raw athleticism. You know, he didn't have the best stick on the team or anything like that. But, and he, you know, he just, he just uh, used his athletic ability to the maximum. Um, and I, I always remember Eddie he was such a good guy. And when we all used to go down to West Point for these training camps, he'd, you know, make sure we were taken care of and we had, had fun and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So we didn't have enough time for preparation. Canada East, they played a whole half season. Canada West, they played a whole half season. You know, I don't really know how USA or Australia picked their teams. I know how ours was brought together, but just that preparation. And I thought we put a, a tremendous show on. When I say show, you know, we as players, and I, we just played a game, but those that are in the spectators are the ones that enjoyed watching that game. They're the ones that can talk about it and their memories, you know, stick with them. I always look at it uh, in two ways. Uh, one is that if it changed, you know, would anything have been differently? And I say that for a reason, I think. By us going out, and I, I had the same uh, thought process as both Dave and Louie. I didn't know there was a Squamish nation. Never, you know, yeah. I've always played with Crossford and Newtown Golden Eagles in either the NALA or the KM League. I've, you know, I, I've never played any other uh, Indian nation out there, and to find out and then witness their talent, you know. I think we had two games with them. They won one and we won the second. So that's why they got you know, a couple more representatives on, on their side because they did beat the uh, native North American natives, which was us bringing this game and beat us that first time. And then we won the second and then you know, it went from there. But that story for me you know, doesn't end there. I ended up, after playing out there, ended up going back out in 81 and played for the North Shore team I ended up back in BC. I had no idea levels of senior A, senior B, or anything. I only know <laughs> competition <laughs> among my brothers here, you know? Yeah. The inner league of all native teams, we didn't play anybody else. We played all, you know, amongst ourselves. Great competition, you know, hard games. Yeah. And to go all the way out west to realize, oh, wow, you know, here's a team that just beat us. You know, we, we thought we had everything in hand. Yeah. And for me to get accepted to go back out and play for the North Shore team, you know, I ended up in the President's Cup that year. But 
to fly back because we're affiliated with the Salmon Bellies, I got to play in the majors the same year. Okay. I got to play in the President's Cup and the Man Cup. All that the was all year. after 1980, the 1980 box. Yeah, and that, that, that was 81, because yeah. the 80 was the World Games. Yeah. We all came back, played in can -Am, finished up. <clears throat> I got to go back out in 81, myself and Barry Paulus. But we met other guys that were from Six Nations that were already out there with North Shore because they were gearing up to go senior A in the majors. They were in the preliminary stages. They submitted their application but weren't accepted yet. This is how, you may not know the story, but that's how everybody was being funneled in that direction. North Shore was gonna go over the first majors even before Six Nations or Chiefs or anybody else. <clears throat> they, were, they were looking at that. How do you put a team together? Well, we all ended up out there and myself and Barry are the only two of that whole team that went back out. The other, Harry and Daryl, were yeah, already out, out there. there. Yeah. They were already mm -hmm. out playing for mm -hmm. North Shore at that particular time. They were from Six Nations. And then to formulate that, did I ever think that I'd be traveling to British Columbia to play lacrosse? Never in my life, never. But this 1980 Nations game allowed us all to make that trip to see a different form of lacrosse on the West Coast. When you look at that uh, Nations 80, the two teams that were teams, club teams, you know, Coquitlam and Brooklyn Redmond, had such an advantage because as he points out, you know, we were, you know, thrown together as an all-star team. We get out west and we introduce two players from the Squamish Nation as well to be incorporated into a team for an upcoming tournament. They had been playing a whole season together and I think that makes a tremendous difference in preparation, you know, uh, to, to play together with the unit. You know, to know your man up and your man down and you know what line mates are going to run together and work well together makes a big difference. And we were a talented group of lacrosse players, but they were more of team, more, had more of the team development because they had been together for a whole season. I think they had an advantage there and I thought we fared pretty well, all things considered. It's unfortunate that after 1980, I don't think they had another world indoor championship for very many years, over 20, obviously, I don't remember it. But. I think it was 20, because I remember, I remember <coughs> something about it, because I know, I think Dwight Metke even played in it because Metke played for 25 years. But, yeah. and I think they said this is the first one. And they don't even, they don't remember what we did. You know, they don't remember the pro league that we played, well, I played in. Um, that's, that's all hearsay, that's all gone now. They don't remember it. It's, it started in 1990. No, no, it started in 1974 is when the pro league started. That should, that should be said, that should be said in stone. It should, uh, the first, mate, the first, uh, box, a uh, world box tournament should be our tournament. And, and I think the other thing was unique is that it was a, it was a, a club team that played. You know, it, it wasn't an all-star team. And no. you look at the world championships after that, you got an all-star team, Canada, all-star team from the U.S. Every, every, every country brought their all-star teams. Well, in 1980, we had two teams that had club teams, uh, the East, Canada East, Canada West, and then you had the native team that was an all-star team, and you had all-star teams from Australia and, and uh, U.S. The difference for us in the nations is we had, we had depth, and uh, when you, you, know, you couldn't focus on, on one line, that um, for us it was uh, the scoring was spread out throughout the team, and, and defensively every line was, could play defense. It wasn't like that. We had, uh, you know, Danny Wilson playing only offense. So, you know, the way the game is played today is on and off the floor. Danny played both ends of the floor. Another off floor a moment that kind of stuck with me was running into Dwight Metke um, in the street, literally. Uh, you, you know, between games one day, Dwight had played in Edmonton the summer before with me, and unbeknownst to me, he was a dual citizen as well. But so Dwight, um, after our year playing junior together in Edmonton, had I I obviously gone to the U.S. Dwight went out to play after his Minto Cup performance, which was stellar. I think he was a goaltender. You know, the tournament, the Minto Cup. Dwight was asked to come out and play in the finishes junior career 
um, I think it was last year, junior, on the West Coast. Uh, I can't remember who he's playing, maybe for New West or whoever. But So he came out there and he was living in Vancouver. He came down to see the Nations in 1980 when we were playing. And he, we ran into each other on the street and he goes, Craig, what, what, what's the story? What the hell are you doing here? And so I explained the situation. I was a dual citizen. You know, they, they picked the team and I managed to, 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 to uh, be part of it. And he said, really? He said, I'm a dual citizen too. And I went, oh my God, Dwight, are you kidding me? Uh, he's such a great guy. And he, you could just see, you know, and, and just, just a positive, enthusiastic, great, obviously great, legendary goaltender. Um, and that, you know, what could have been if we had actually had to connect the dots and, and Dwight was part of that team. I think he, he subsequently, a few years later, I think he did play, whether there was another kind of international box format, he did actually play one or two years at least, or one or two occasions where he played for Team US. But uh, I just, like I say, I wonder, you know, whether the scores would have been much different if we had had Dwight, I, I bet you they would have. And someone instilled that medicine game in me because that's what brings everybody together, is when you come together. You know, you, you're, in, you're in a box um, reception area and you're looking out at the crowd. You don't see the crowd because you're focused on the game. Now that we're older and you watch your grandkids and your kids play because you've passed that on, because somebody before us passed it to us. We're only, we're only one telephone pole on a long list of telephone poles giving that message. And again, that's, I, that's where I truly believe that the Creator steps in and offers that to us to play that game and to play it well. Not to play it dirty, but to play it well. And that's the one thing that, in your question, you know, what has it done? It, it, it enabled that friendship to come to my side of the table and for me to offer that to that next person I meet whose interests are in that game of lacrosse. I think back of all the good memories. So I've had a chance to reminisce and talk to people about it and um, got today to talk to Stan and, and, and Mr. Colley here about just, you know, and share some old stories and have some, have some laughs. And just, it reminds me of just how much fun we had. Uh, although it was serious competition, you know, at, at, the, at the Nations Cup and when we played major, you think back to the friendships you made um, and the memories you've got, which yeah, no one can take away. So yeah, I, it was great. Well, it's hard to remember all the scores and who you played, but he, John's 100% right. It's the, the friendship you make along the way, and you still stay in touch with some of the people. And I, my personal side, I stay in touch with a lot of the British Columbia people uh, because uh, they're at the world stage with the World Cup now, so I get to see them a lot more. Uh, Stan, I seen Stan, last time I seen him was over in Finland. So here we, we live maybe a couple hours from each other, and I see him over there. You know, the old phrase that comes up, you know, Allow me the opportunity, and I'll show you I can do it better than anybody else. But you have to allow me the opportunity. And that's what we're talking about in 1980. We were allowed that opportunity at that level. And I believe that last game would have been ours mm -hmm. had we had at least two weeks more preparation or half a season together yeah. like mm -hmm. the two Canadian teams. I'm curious how this might have impacted Oren Lyons and you know, his development of the Iroquois Nationals because it was kind of the seed um, of, of bringing the, the different yeah. nations together in, in 1980 and then the, uh, the, uh, the Nationals came, came about. I mean, it's probably something that was thought about you know, simultaneously, but this was an event that you could say, look it, we threw this team together, look how they fared. We get this thing organized, play at the world level, who knows? You know, we got, we got some talent. We can showcase what we can do and uh, promote the game and, and be, and, you know, um, excellent competitors. You know, even though we're small in numbers, you know, we're big in heart. So that makes a big difference. What sticks in my mind is the fact that we got to go to Australia. That was the biggest thing. After the game. After because the... after we won, the Australians <laughs> wanted us to come over and teach them box across. So... It was, it was a team thing, too, because we all went and cut wood and, and sold wood and, 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 and uh, raised money for us for our trip to, uh, to Australia. And um, it was the best trip I've ever, I've ever taken. Two weeks with, with all your buddies over in Australia having nothing but fun because it wasn't, I mean, we went over there and played in gyms. So it wasn't lacrosse. It was meeting people and, uh, and being with your friends. 
It was it was it was by far the best the best thing I've ever done on the cross. From my personal travels, I'd have to say that this opened a door for many of our younger players. They saw that we could do it. And again, I, I, I pay a lot of respect for those that created the ability for us to travel. Whoever thought you'd be competing in it or even invited to attend to participate in the nation's 80. I mean, that was, a, that was never a dream because it, it never had happened. It had never been in place. You know, I, my own experience is I used to walk up the hill from my house, go over the hill and our community lacrosse box would be sitting there. That was my dream, was to be able to play in that box. You know, as a child coming up, instead of playing in a backyard like I grew up, you know, a couple sticks stuck in the ground and playing in a backyard to taking that next step, having my own lacrosse stick, walking over that hill and having that whole box available to me every day. I, I guess I would just echo the same things that, um, you know, we met out there and it was like, you know, we seen each other yesterday. Yeah. You just, yeah. just, you just kind of get right back into it. Wait, how you doing? What you doing? You just laugh, we're joking. Um, and I guess, you know, I've been lucky with my perspective that it's that same feeling everywhere in the world where lacrosse is played right now. It's just, it really is something about our game that just draws people together for life and friendships for life. Um, you know, the one story I always tell is, you know, if I'm, you know, I'm in Australia and if I see somebody with a hockey jersey on, I might say, oh, you know, geez, wait, look, somebody's wearing a hockey jersey. But if I see somebody with a Peterborough shirt, lacrosse shirt on, I go right over and say, hey, how you doing, Peterborough, lacrosse, you're a lacrosse guy. And it's just, I hope we never lose that family atmosphere internationally. Because um, the one thing I can tell you is it doesn't matter if you're this, we, we have 64, 65 countries now playing internationally. And it doesn't matter if you're the 65 rated country or the best one. I can tell you that even if they don't have the skills that our players have, they have at least as much or if not more passion. Just seeing some of these players play and how excited they are just to be playing lacrosse, um, scoring their first goal, getting their first win. Um, that, you know, that's kind of the stuff that's kept me going over the years. They, they just love our game. They picked it up and they just love it. Well, for me, I think um, the years shortly after the Night Nations, and even the, the following year, I mean, it became, I think, a non-event to a lot of people in the WLA, maybe, um, and nobody remembered it. Um, I mean, till now, till you know, we're getting this time to talk about it. Um, it wasn't talked about much other than within our organization and, and players. Um, it didn't have a lot of status with the rest of the league. Nobody ever said, hey, these guys were the world championships, or champions or, or anything like that. So it was, it was disappointing that it didn't get more, uh, I wouldn't say press, but more status, status as a recognition as a, as a quality event that you know, brought in you know, eight, 9,000 people to a game. And that wasn't happening much in, the, in that era. Um, so th that was yeah, disappointing to me. Because it, it was a lot of fun. Everybody says creator's game is not for the player. It's for the spectator. And I truly believe that. Because you're only focused on the game when you're playing. But now that you watch it at our young age, you, you, know, you understand it entirely differently. It was meant for the spectator. That's the enjoyment that you get. Whether it's frustration on a loss, but the ideology of being able to play that game, someone gave you that first stick, you learned how to use it, and now you're passing it on to generations after you. You know, that seven generation concept that we utilize in our community, that's where it all comes to. If you're not the teacher, who's the receiver? Who's the student? We're all students at one time, and even in our young age now, we still become that student because now we're that spectator. We're enjoying what everybody's enjoyed far beyond us. And it's giving back to us, coming full circle. I know we're here for the interview, but it's the other things that
create our friendship. And that's what lacrosse does. You know, you can put everything and bring it all together, but we all have that tie, not only for being here, but what brings brothers together from different nations is this game. I think when it was all said and done and years later, it's, it's what you look back on. Sometimes, you know, losses that were disappointing or, or, or were much more important than, than wins in, in your development in the game and everything else. And you remember the guys and the fun times that you had, and, and you, you don't go into your jewelry box and count your man cup no. rings. That's not what it's really important in the game when you've, when you've left it.